Have you ever heard the expression that people only wear about 20% of their wardrobe? Well, I think the same could be said about how much they use the metrics in their running watches. There's so many, it can be completely overwhelming. There are loads that can help you on your run, after your run to analyze your runs themselves or to help you improve your overall fitness. So I'm gonna do my best to take you through all of those different metrics today as quickly as I can and keeping them interesting using Garmin's 965 as my guide. Now, if you get all the way through with no surprises, that's incredibly impressive because there are a lot, but stick around to the end because I've got a very special guest who's gonna be talking to us about a new feature which I'm really excited about. Okay, so let's speed through some of the basics before we get stuck into the really detailed metrics and actually it's easier to do these on the run. So let's get going. Number one is pace, which is how fast you're going, either in minutes per mile or minutes per kilometer. And that's a live up to the second snapshot of exactly how fast you're going at that moment in time. And number two is average pace. That's the average pace you've been running at up until that moment in time when you're looking at it on the run or after the run is the average for the entire run. Number three is lap. So you can manually lap on any run by pressing the bottom right hand button on most Garmin models, or you could choose to set up an auto lap for a distance of your choosing, or maybe one kilometer or one mile. And then when you're in the lap, you can see your lap metrics if you've got them set up as a data screen, or at the end of each lap, they'll pop up on screen so you can see a summary. So you might want to look at lap distance, lap pace, or lap time when you're doing intervals, for example. And I actually choose to use lap pace all the time on all my runs because I prefer to know the pace of the mile or kilometer that I'm running right now rather than the instantaneous pace, which can fluctuate a little bit more. Next up, a slightly unusual one, which is speed. That's measured in kilometers an hour or miles per hour, which is why it's different to pace. A little bit more unusual to use when running, but you might want to find out how fast you're going. Then straightforward, you've got time, which is how long you've been running for, and elapsed time, which is how long you've been out for in total. Then we move on to distance again, a pretty obvious one, how far you've been going, either in miles or kilometers. And there is something called 3D distance, which is really interesting, but we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Then there are calories, so how much energy you've burned or are burning is measured in calories and your watch can tell you your calorie burn for the day so far during an activity and after an activity and you can also go into Garmin Connect and add in food and water consumption in order to feed into that data so in fact if you're going on a longer run then you could be reminded to fuel or hydrate at appropriate points so that's the basics covered let's head back into the studio for some more complicated stats so most of these stats you can measure on the run and look at after the run for more of a deep dive, but because some of them are more complicated than others, and I don't think I'm capable of running and talking to you about them at the same time, I'm gonna sit in the studio and do them, but we'll cover both. Heart rate and heart rate zones are a great way of measuring your exertion on your run as an alternative to pace because they'll change with how you're feeling and how hot it is and things like that. For example, we've got a great video on the running channel already, which you can check out here, telling you how to set up those heart rate zones. But you should know that you can look at them on your run in terms of seeing your heart rate, seeing a color code, from grey all the way up to red as to how hard you're working and which of the zones you might be operating in. And after the run, you can take a look at how long you spend in each of those zones. So if you were targeting a very specific type of run or workout, you can know whether you did it effectively. So your heart rate will be affected by running up or down hills, but so will your pace. So grade adjusted pace or GAP is a data field that you can look at to see what your equivalent pace would be on the flat, regardless of the grade which you're running up or down. So it can be a way of helping you understand the pace regardless of the terrain you're running on. Okay, back outside, we're gonna put my knowledge to the test on the run a few times, I think, in this video, starting with cadence, which is how many steps you take per minute. And then another measure that's relevant to cadence is your stride length. That's how long each individual stride is. You might want to look at that afterwards in Garmin Connect to see whether you can see any changes in your stride length and cadence based on whether you get fatigued when you're going up and down hills and basically just keep an eye on it. Then there's ground contact time, which is literally a measure of how long each of your feet spends on the ground. And you want that to be as short as possible. In fact, if you ended up over striding, which is where you reach out in front of you in order to achieve that longer stride length, then what will happen is you'll end up breaking with your heel. And then as you bring your hips up and over your foot, which slows you down and means you spend ages on the ground, which is really inefficient. Then there's ground contact time balance, which is how balanced you are between left and right. So there's a gauge from 50% and above with an arrow that will point to the side where you're spending more time on the ground. There's a normal range to have a slight imbalance, but if that balance goes outside that normal boundary, then you might be looking at an imbalance that could lead to injury ultimately. So you might want to look at strengthening exercises to try and even up that imbalance. 
You've got vertical oscillation, which is a measure of how much you're going up and down, so how much you're oscillating vertically. And you want that number, ideally, to be as low as possible. The theory being that if you spend time and energy going up and down, you're not putting that energy into propelling yourself forwards. Then we've got vertical ratio, which is a ratio of that vertical oscillation measurement divided by your stride length. So how much you're going up and down divided by how far forwards you go. And you want that to be relatively low, because again, you're not wasting energy going up and down. Then there's power, which is a measurement that cyclists might be more familiar with, but maybe not runners. Ultimately, it's an alternative alternative to pace and heart rate for pacing your effort or gauging your effort on a run. It's also instantaneous. Heart rate will take a long while to kind of catch up if you put in a big surge, whereas power will instantaneously register. It's a way of leveling the field, whether you're running on the flat or whether you're running up a hill, whether it's windy or not, you can run at a consistent power. Ultimately, it could be a way of choosing to pace your runs to stop yourself from fatiguing too early. All of those metrics that I've just whizzed through are commonly referred to as running dynamics. And if you want those stats to be as accurate as possible on your runs, then you could consider investing in something else additionally to your watch, like a running pod, which you clip onto the back of your shorts so it can more accurately measure that kind of left and right balance, for example, or something like Garmin's HRM Pro or HRM Pro Plus, which has built-in sensors for the strap that you wear around your chest to measure your heart rate, which will also improve the accuracy of all of those dynamic stats. Some Garmin watches can also automatically recognize when you're running or exercising in new or unusual conditions. So whether that's at higher altitude or in hotter than normal conditions. It does that by combining GPS location data with weather reports from your paired smartphone and ultimately it can pop up at the end of an activity with a score to let you know how well acclimatized you are at that point to the new running conditions. Your watch can also determine your lactate threshold, which is the point, broadly speaking, at which you transition from working fully aerobically to start to doing some of your energy from anaerobic exercise. And that might mean that you can't maintain that pace for too long and it's important to know this point because if you want to do a proper tempo or threshold run as part of your training, then you want to make sure you're doing it at the right effort. And your watch will be able to indicate that in terms of a pace to run at or a specific heart rate. And Sarah actually tested out the accuracy of both VO2 max measurements on a smartwatch and your lactate threshold measurements in the lab and found them to be amazingly accurate. In order to perform at your best, then you're gonna to need to recover as effectively as possible. And that's what recovery time is aimed at giving you advice on. It takes into account things like heart rate variability, the quality of the sleep that you're having, your overall stress, and the really hard activity that you've just done to give you a recommendation of how long it should be before you do another really hard bout of exercise. So that doesn't mean that you can't exercise in that recovery window. It just means that you should keep it to a lower intensity until you're fully recovered in order to go hard again. But bear in mind that what you do in that recovery window can elongate your recovery. So if you do too much, it's gonna keep advising you to take more recovery before you go hard again. Equally though, if you get an amazing night's sleep or you're just lazy like me, then you might be able to reduce that recovery window by doing less exercise. VO2 max is a fairly universal measure of your aerobic endurance. Broadly speaking, it looks at how effectively you can take in and use oxygen in your muscles. So a higher VO2 max score will mean you're more aerobically fit and likely better at endurance sport activities. But that doesn't mean that if you go out and do lots of long, slow runs, you'll improve your VO2 max. We've got a video all about how you might want to improve your VO2 max. So check that out if you want more information about that. And then also bear in mind there's something called trail VO2 max, which will mean your watch and Garmin Connect will take into account the fact that you might be running at higher heart rates and slower paces on trails than you would on road, which might make it look like you're less fit. So it will take that into account. Last one in this section is 3D distance, which is a measure of distance in 3D space. So if you think about how distance is normally measured by a satellite from above, you're measuring the distance between these two points. But if actually on the map in real life, you're starting down here and ending up up here, then this is your 3D distance. Body battery is a feature that takes into account things like heart rate variability, stress, and your level of activity throughout the day to give you a score as to how tired you are. So if you're really well rested, it'll start at 100, and then as you fatigue, it'll go all the way down to five if you're really in need of a rest. Now use this next one with caution, depending on how scared you might be of the result, but your fitness age is exactly that. So compared to the general population, how fit are you in terms of age compared to your actual age? So I was feeling pretty smug because mine's 32 and I'm actually nearly 41, but then Sarah's just piped up that hers just off camera over there is 19. So <sighs> leave us some hate in the comments, please. Next up, we've got heart rate variability or HRV, which is a measure of the time between successive heartbeats. And actually slightly counterintuitively to me, at least a higher heart rate variability, so more variability in the time between heartbeats is actually a good indicator of good overall health. Whereas a lower HRV means that potentially you could be fatigued or overtraining or maybe even fighting off some kind of infection. So that could be a good early indicator. And it's a good thing that this metric is actually factored into a lot of the other recommendations within Garmin's ecosystem. One of the 
the metrics it directly uses HRV to input to its score is stress. So it gives you a score from 0 to 100, where 0 is you're very relaxed and probably at rest, and 100 would be very, very stressed. And it will also sometimes offer you the option for a breathing exercise that could potentially help you to lower your stress scores at that moment in time. Intensity minutes is something that includes both the exercise that you do as part of a designated activity, but also just your general movement throughout the day. So if you did just go for a brisk walk, then your watch will work out your heart rate relative to your normal average resting heart rate and determine how much intensity minutes you've achieved in that time. Sleep score is fairly self-explanatory. It tells you how well you slept on a level from zero to 100, where 100 would be the best possible sleep. It'll tell you how long you spent in each different stage of sleep, and then give you an assessment of how well you slept overall and how you might feel that next day, as well as providing you with insights as to how you might be able to sleep better in the future. Anna actually tried this for 30 full days where she was tracking her sleep and trying to make the best possible decisions for her training. So check that out if you'd like to find out a little bit more. Thanks for bearing with me, we're powering through. If you like running metrics as much as I do, I'm a proper geek, then I also thought you might like the chance to win a Garmin watch. And I'm gonna tell you exactly how if you keep watching. So stay tuned, it's gonna involve liking the video and dropping a very specific comment. So keep watching. Then you've got training status, which will give you a one word definition of how your training's been going, whether that's productive, whether you're detraining, if you actually haven't been doing enough training to maintain your current level of fitness. And then within training status, you'll also know your training load. So after an individual run, then you'll be told the load, the physiological load that you've put on your body from that run, and that'll impact things like recovery time and also the measures of fitness that the watch is recording. Then you've got acute load, which is a look at that total training load on your body over a period of seven days. And then that takes you into training load focus, which is how much of your training load has been in each of three zones, anaerobic, high aerobic, and low aerobic. And you're looking for an optimal distribution across those three. Your watch will tell you if you're outside that optimal zone. But if you're training for a particular distance, you actually might want to bias maybe to the anaerobic zone, for example. And to complete the set, you've got training effect. So at the end of each of your runs, you get a summary in the training effect as to what type of run it was. Essentially, it'd be classified. So maybe that if you spent a lot of time in a particular zone, it might define it as a threshold run, or otherwise it could be a base run amongst many other examples. Pulse Ox measures the saturation of oxygen in the bloodstream. So similar to the finger monitors that you might be familiar with from anyone who's been unfortunate to be in hospitals to have their blood oxygen levels measured. So that measures your SpO2 percentage, the saturation of oxygen in their blood. This is usually in the high 90s. It will go lower if you go to altitude, for example. So that could be a way of monitoring your response to altitude. Respiration rate describes the frequency at which you're breathing, so how often you're inhaling and exhaling. So that could be a core measure alongside things like heart rate. Your resting heart rate takes the lowest 30 minute average in a 24 hour period. So if you do wear your watch at night, you'll get the most accurate measure of your resting heart rate, which then informs a lot of the other metrics on the watch. A nice simple one before we dive into all of the metrics that can help you improve your running, and that's steps. So those are the steps that you take throughout the day, whether that's recorded in an activity or automatically detected from your arm swings. First up, we've got performance condition, which will pop up on your watch after about six minutes of your run. Once your watch has had a chance to take into account your heart rate and your pace and compare those to what's normal for you to see how you're feeling relative to your normal levels of fitness and therefore how ready you are to perform on this individual run. That's on a scale from minus 20, which would be bad, and then plus 20, which would mean you're super ready, about as ready as you could possibly be to go and smash this workout. Training readiness is a widget on the watch, or you can look at it on Garmin Connect, like loads of the stuff that we're talking about today. And that takes into account the relationship between things like sleep, recovery, heart rate variability, the amount of training that you've done, in order to give you an assessment of how ready you are to go out and train. So it'll broadly give you a score on a gauge. Right now, I've been pretty lazy, so my training readiness is high because it says I'm well recovered. There's an activity profile called track running that you might want to use when you're running on the track to give you maximum accuracy. It avoids things like running a full lap of the track, which you know is exactly 400 meters and your watch telling you something slightly different. It needs calibrating, which involves running four laps in lane one, but after you've done that, you should get the most accurate possible activities when you're recording on the track. So when we're talking about all these metrics, you wanna make sure they're as accurate as possible. And your watch will likely ship with something called smart recording turned on. That's the data recording setting, which means it tries to preserve battery life. So you might wanna find the menu new item and then change that to every second to give you the best possible accuracy for things like heart rate and GPS. Talking about GPS, that's ultimately what gives you the accuracy of the tracking. So how fast you're going, where you've run, all of those things. And within the menu settings, you can choose from GPS only, which is possibly the least accurate, but saves the most battery. And then you can step up through kind of better and best settings as to how accurate that GPS is using GPS and multiband and all of the different satellite systems. And then there's also Garmin's auto setting, which uses their SAT IQ to give you the best balance between GPS accuracy and battery life automatically, depending on the environment that you're running in. 
Pace Pro is a system that can help you with a pacing strategy. So you input the distance that you want to run, the race that you're running, and then you can program in exactly how you would like to pace it. So how fast you want to go in certain sections, whether you want to take into account the fact that it's hilly here and you might have to slow down, then the watch will guide you through on the run itself acting as your pacemaker. In fact, you can check out a video that we did on the running channel where Sarah did exactly this for a half marathon. Similarly, if you're taking on a hilly route, then you can use something called Climb Pro, which will give you an idea of the hills that are coming up, how long they're gonna be, their exact gradient and so on, and you can add this as a data screen so you can know exactly what you're gonna take on as you're running. Race Predictor does exactly what it says on the tin, that is, that it uses things like VO2 max and your training history to work out how fast you can run for key distances, namely 5K, 10K, half marathon, and marathon. And now, more recently, you can also track your progress in terms of the predicted time graphically on the watch over time to have a look at the impact that your training's having on the different predicted times for those distances. One of my favorite features is navigation. It's not available on all watches, but on watches from the 255 upwards, it's available in some form, whether that's breadcrumb or full mapping. And ultimately what this means is either just on your watch or using Garmin Connect, you can plot a route and then follow it either with turn by turn or that breadcrumb that I mentioned. And it'll tell you exactly where to go. So I use it a lot when I'm exploring somewhere new. I don't know exactly where to go. I can just pop in. I want to run 10K vaguely in that direction. And I want to run it on trails or I want to run it on the roads. And it'll plot that route for me, send it to my watch and I'm away. Stamina is another amazing feature that's available on selected watches again. And this actually gives you a real time guide as to how long you could keep going for or how far you could keep going for at your current effort. If you go too fast, too soon, then you'll see your real time stamina dip away from your potential stamina at that point in time. And then if you back off a little bit and recover, you'll see it recover back up again. It's a really good gauge to make sure you know you're gonna be able to sustain your current effort. Now, speaking of stamina, you've got incredible stamina for having stuck with me through all of the metrics so far. I didn't write this, it's incredibly painful. That is entirely Sarah Hartley's fault for writing that little bit of the script. But if you would like to win a Garmin watch, now's your chance. So make sure you like the video and you drop us a comment for which running metrics you use the most, whether that's on a run or after a run to analyze it, what do you find most interesting? And then you will be in with a chance of winning a Garmin watch. Okay, we're nearly there. One more feature before we go on to two incredible new features, and that is suggested workouts, which Sarah did a video where she followed exactly what her watch told her to do for 30 days and what she learned from that, which I thought was incredible. And suggested workouts do exactly what you think. If you don't know exactly how you want to train for a specific event or distance, or just generally to get more fit, then suggested workouts on your watch will help you. So every day they'll give you a suggestion as to what you could do. You can look ahead to see what it's gonna suggest you over the next seven days as well. And this is a feature which takes into account all of the different training that you're doing and will give you new suggestions based on how much fitter you get with a specific goal in mind if you do input the race to the race widget feature. Now for a final couple of metrics which are really exciting because they're relatively new. The first of those is called endurance score. And whilst VO2 max is a really good measure of your aerobic endurance, two people with the same VO2 max could be better suited to very different activities because ultimately higher intensity activity does contribute to a higher VO2 max. So you could be running five or 10K or you could be wanting to run a marathon or further. Whereas endurance score will generally take into account your ability to take on endurance exercise. So longer distances. So it doesn't matter how far that is, you'll be able to see it improve as you improve your endurance ultimately. But it might mean that if you wanted to focus on lower aerobic running, then you'd still be able to see your endurance score improve even though your VO2 max might not. And the second and final metric is called hill score. And much like endurance score, this is only available on some of the newer watches. But what it aims to do is give you a grade, so a score from naught to 100 as to how good you are at running up hills. It will take into account any gradient above 2% on runs, walks, and hikes that you record on your watch. More recent activities will have a greater weighting towards that score, but it will take into account months of different data. And then within the hill score, there are two different scores. There's hill endurance, so how good you are at running up longer hills and hill strength, which is how good you are probably at sprinting up shorter hills. And so I'm gonna hand over to James because I'm rubbish at hills, just to give you a little bit of insight as to why he thinks this is so exciting. Uphill running is fundamentally different from running on the flat and can be a personal strength or a personal weakness. Spending the time and investing in hill climbing and hill repeats will pay dividends come race day and can actually be a personal advantage. More than that, you'll find that actually training on the hills will make your overall running improve as well. There's a personal little challenge in each and every race or each and every training session, and there's usually a pretty good view at the top. And that is every single metric on Garmin running watches covered tick. So hopefully you found that interesting. If you'd like the chance to win a Garmin watch, don't forget to comment below which metric is your favorite, which one you use the most to analyze your runs or on the runs themselves. And then if you're thinking about buying a watch, maybe investing in a new one, then click here to find out which Garmin is right for you.